Hi guys and welcome to Global Crime Time. First things first, please smash a like on this video and if this is your first visit to the channel, please consider subscribing. Don't forget the notification bell so you know when my videos are released. Now, today I will be talking about the shooting of an English musician, John Lennon, formerly of the Beatles, who on the evening of the 8th of December 1980 was shot outside of his residence, the Dakota, in New York City. In this video, I'll be looking into the facts of the shooting and what drove one Mark David Chapman to shoot and kill John Lennon. For those who don't know who John Lennon was, and I can't see there being too many, here was a quick rundown of who he was. John Lennon was born on the 9th of October 1940 in Oxford Street Maternity Hospital, Liverpool. During his childhood he saw little of his father, Freddie, who went AWOL while serving in the Navy. For several years, John was brought up by his mother's sister, Mimi. In his early years, John was a cheeky student who liked to take the mickey out of his teachers and other students. His school reports were often terrible. Whilst in his early teens, he got his first guitar and would spend many, many hours playing. He failed all of his O-levels, but was still accepted to the Liverpool College of Art. However, he was expelled from college before his final year because of his behaviour. In the late 1950s, Lennon formed a rock group called the Quarrymen Skiffle Band. In 1957, he met and formed a successful musical partnership with Paul McCartney. Lennon was considered the leader of the Beatles due to his superior age and also his musical abilities. It was, however, McCartney who persuaded Lennon to allow George Harrison to enter the band as the lead guitarist. After being rejected by many music labels, the group signed an agreement with Parlophone in 1962. George Martin, who was responsible for signing the Beatles, later said he was not particularly impressed by their demo tapes, but liked their wit and humour. Lennon agreed to the suggestion of manager Brian Epstein for the band to dress smartly and have similar haircuts. In the early years of the Beatles, the smart-suited Beatles was part of their cultivated image. John Lennon was no stranger to controversy. In 1966, he made a remark in an interview with the Evening Standard. Christianity will go, it will vanish and shrink. We're more popular than Jesus now. I don't know which will go first, rock and roll or Christianity. He claimed this was just an observation. However, it led to a boycott in the US, especially in the Deep South. There was also a wave of record burnings, although Lennon remarked that to burn them, they also had to buy them first. During the 1960s, Lennon began to frequently take LSD and by 1967 was a heavy user. This also coincided with a period of uncertainty and he considered leaving the Beatles. The death of Brian Epstein, their manager in 67, also hit Lennon and the Beatles hard. In 69, the Beatles started to split up. Lennon was clean, keen to branch out and develop his own solo career. There were also frictions over the presence of his wife Yoko Ono in the Beatles recording sessions. After the breakup of the Beatles, Lennon pursued a very successful solo career. In the early 1970s, Lennon also became a figurehead for those opposed to the Vietnam War. His song, Give Peace a Chance, became an anthem for the anti-war movement. Due to his anti-war stance, the Nixon administration tried to have him deported, but after a long struggle, he was able to gain a green card. Lennon's song, Imagine, has also become an influential song to many. In 1975, he backed away from the music world, preferring to spend time with his new son, Sean. John Lennon married Cynthia Powell in 1963, though the marriage was kept secret. They had one son, Julian. The marriage broke down in 1967, Lennon then married Yoko Ono in March 1969. By 2012, Lennon had sold 14 million solo albums, whilst the Beatles had become the best-selling group of all time, with an estimated 600 million record in sales worldwide. Yeah, I don't believe all the population, you know. I, I think that's just a kind of myth that the oh. uh, government has thrown out to keep your mind off Vietnam and Ireland and all the important subjects. Oh, I think you're wrong about that. Oh, I don't care. On the 8th of December 1980, 25-year-old Hawaiian and former security guard Mark David Chapman 
was outside Lennon's residence at the Dakota buildings in New York City. He spent most of the morning hanging around the building's entrance, hoping to get to meet Lennon. He passed the time by talking to the fans and the Dakota building doorman. Unfortunately, Chapman was distracted and missed seeing Lennon step out of a cab and enter the Dakota. Later on, Chapman met Lennon's family nanny, Helen Seaman, who was returning from a walk with Lennon's five-year-old son, Sean. Chapman reached in front of the housekeeper to shake Sean's hand and said that he was a beautiful boy, quoting Lennon's song, Beautiful Boy. Photographer Annie Leibovitz went to the Lennon's apartment to do a photo shoot for Rolling on Thin Ice. Leibovitz promised them that a photo of the two of them naked together would make the front cover of the magazine. Leibovitz took several photos of John Lennon alone and one was originally set to be on the cover. Although Ono did not want to be naked, Lennon insisted that both he and his wife be on the cover and after taking the pictures, Leibovitz left their apartment at 3.30pm. After the photo shoot, Lennon gave an interview to a radio station at around 5pm, Lennon and Ono left their apartment to mix the song Walking on Thin Ice at the record plant recording studio. As they left the building, the pair was approached by Chapman, who asked for Lennon's autograph on a copy of his album, Double Fantasy. Lennon was appreciative of his fans and liked to give autographs or pictures, especially to those who had been waiting for long periods of time to meet him. Later, Chapman said, he was very kind to me, very kind and was very patient. The limousine was waiting and he took his time with me and he saw my album. He asked me if I needed anything else. I said, no, no, sir and he walked away. John and Ono spent several hours at the record plant before returning to the Dakota around 10.50 p.m. Lennon wanted to be home to say goodnight to his son before he was due at the Stage Deli restaurant with Ono. The Lennons got out of their limousine on a 72nd Street instead of driving into a secure courtyard of the Dakota buildings. They passed Chapman and walked towards the archway entrance of the Dakota building. As Ono passed, Chapman nodded at her. As Lennon passed by, he glanced briefly at Chapman appearing to recognise him from earlier. Seconds later, Chapman pulled out a gun, which was hidden in his jacket pocket. He aimed at the middle of Lennon's back and let off five shots using hollow point bullets. Chapman was only nine or ten feet away from Lennon when he shot him. One bullet missed Lennon and struck a window of the Dakota. According to the autopsy report, two bullets entered the left side of Lennon's back, travelling through the left side of his chest and his left lung, and one exited him from the body and one lodged in his neck. Two more bullets hit Lennon in his left shoulder. Lennon was bleeding badly from external wounds and from his mouth. He staggered up five steps to the security reception area where he said, I'm shot, I'm shot. He then fell to the floor, dropping some cassettes that he was holding. The doorman of the Dakota, Jose Podoma, got the gun out of Chapman's hand and kicked it across the pavement. Concierge worker Jay Hastings started to make a tourniquet. He ripped open Lennon's shirt. When he saw the severity of Lennon's injuries, he covered Lennon's chest with his uniform jacket, removed his blood-stained glasses and called the emergency services. Chapman removed his jacket and hat to show he was not carrying any concealed weapons and remained standing on West 72nd Street waiting for police to arrive. Podomo shouted at Chapman, do you know what you just did? To which Chapman calmly replied, I just shot John Lennon. The first police officers on the scene were Stephen Spiro and Peter Cullen. They were at 72nd Street and Broadway when they heard a report of shots fired at the Dakota. The officers arrived around two minutes after the report and found Chapman standing very calmly on West 72nd Street reading a paperback copy of The Catcher in the Rye. They immediately arrested Chapman, placed him in handcuffs and put him in the back of their police vehicle. Chapman made no attempt to flee or resist arrest. Cullen said, he apologised to us for ruining our night. I turned around to him and said, you've got to be fucking kidding me. You're worried about our night. Do you know what you just did to your life? We read him his rights. The second officer to arrive on the scene were Herd Forenberger and his partner, Tony Palmer. They found Lennon lying face down on the floor of the reception area blood pouring from his mouth and his clothing blood soaked, with Hastings trying to help him. Officers James Moran and Bill Gamble then arrived on the scene and Forenberger came to the conclusion that Lennon's injuries were so serious to wait for an ambulance and to put Lennon in their car. Moran and Gamble then drove Lennon to Roosevelt Hospital on West 59th Street 
followed by Frohenberger and Palmer, who drove Ono to the hospital. According to Gamble, in the car, Moran asked, Are you John Lennon? Or, do you know who you are? To which Lennon nodded, but could only manage to make a moaning and gurgling sound when he tried to speak, and then lost consciousness. They arrived at Roosevelt Hospital with Lennon around 11pm. Moran was demanding a doctor for a multiple gunshot wound victim. When Lennon was brought in, he was not breathing and had no pulse. Three doctors, a nurse and two or three other medical attendants worked on Lennon for 10 to 20 minutes in an attempt to resuscitate him. As a last resort, the doctors cut open Lennon's chest and attempted manual heart massage to restore circulation, but they quickly discovered that the damage to the blood vessels above and around Lennon's heart from the multiple bullet wounds was too great. Three of the four bullets that struck Lennon's back passed completely through his body and out of his chest, while the fourth lodged itself in his, in his aorta beside his heart. One of the exiting bullets from his chest hit and became lodged in his upper left arm. Several of the wounds could have been fatal by themselves because each bullet had ruptured vital arteries around the heart. Lennon was shot four times at close range and his affected organs, particularly his left lung and major blood vessels above his heart, were virtually destroyed upon impact. Attempts to resuscitate Lennon were stopped and he was pronounced dead. According to his death certificate, Lennon was pronounced dead on arrival at 11.15pm, but the time of 11.07pm has also been reported. Lennon's body was then taken to the city morgue at 521st Avenue for an autopsy. The cause of death was reported on his death certificate as hypovolemic shock caused by the loss of more than 80% of blood volume due to multiple through and through gunshot wounds to the left shoulder and left chest resulting in damage to the left lung, the left subclavian artery and both the aorta and aortic arch. According to the report, even with prompt medical treatment, no person could have lived for more than a few minutes with multiple bullet wounds affecting all of the major arteries and veins around the heart. Yoko Ono asked the hospital not to report to the media that her husband was dead until she told their five-year-old son who was at home. Ono said he was probably watching television and that she did not want him to learn of his father's death from a TV announcement. However, news producer Alan J. Vice of WABC TV happening to be waiting for treatment in the Roosevelt Hospital emergency room after being injured in a crash earlier. Police officers wheeled Lennon into the same room as Vice and mentioned what happened. Vice called his station and relayed the information. An unspeakable tragedy confirmed to us by ABC News in New York City. John Lennon outside of his apartment building on the west side of New York City, the most famous perhaps of all of the Beatles, shot twice in the back, rushed to Roosevelt Hospital, dead on arrival. The following day, Ono issued a statement. There was no funeral for John. Later in the week, we will set the time for a silent vigil to pray for his soul. We invite you to participate from wherever you are at the time. John loved and prayed for the human race. Please pray the same for him, love, Yoko and Sean. George Harrison issued a statement for the press saying, After all we went through together, I had and still have great love and respect for him. I am shocked and stunned. To rob a life is the ultimate robbery in life. The perpetual encroachment on other people's space is taken to the limit with the use of a gun. It is an outrage that people can take other people's lives when they obviously haven't got their own lives in order. Paul McCartney spoke outside his Sussex home that morning and said, I can't take it at the moment. John was a great man who will be remembered for his unique contributions to art, music and peace. He is going to be missed by the whole world. Ringo Starr, who was in the Bahamas at the time, received a phone call from his children informing him about the murder. He flew to New York City to consult Ono and played with Lennon's son, Sean. On the 14th of December, millions of people around the world paused for 10 minutes of silence to remember Lennon, including 30,000 people gathered in Lennon's hometown of Liverpool and over 225,000 people in Central Park, close to the scene of the shooting. For those 10 minutes, every radio station in New York City went off the air. At least three Beatles fans committed suicide after the murder, leading Ono to make a public appeal asking mourners not to give in to the despair. On the 18th of January 1981, a full-page open letter from Ono appeared in the New York Times and the Washington Post, titled Ingratitude. It expressed thanks to the millions of people who mourn Lennon's loss. Double Fantasy, which was released three weeks before Lennon's murder to mixed critical reaction, 
and initially unremarkable sales, become a worldwide commercial success and won the 1981 Grammy Award for Album of the Year. Ono released a solo album, Season of Glass, in 1981. The cover of the album is a photograph of Lennon's blood-splattered glasses that he was wearing when he was shot. That same year, she also released Walking on Thin Ice, the song the Lennons had mixed at the record plant less than an hour before Lennon was murdered. In June 2016, Jay Hastings, the Dakota doorman who tried to help Lennon, sold the shirt he was wearing that night stained with Lennon's blood at an auction for $42,500. The day after Lennon's murder, his remains were cremated at Ferncliffe Cemetery in Hartsdale, Westchester County, New York and his ashes were scattered in Central Park, in sight of their apartment. Mark Chapman was taken to the 20th Precinct on West 82nd Street, where he was questioned for eight hours before being brought to New York County Criminal Court. A judge remanded Chapman to Bellevue Hospital for psychiatric evaluation. Meanwhile, Chapman was charged with second degree murder of Lennon. We have arrested Mark David Chapman for the homicide of John Lennon. Despite advice by his lawyers to plead insanity, Chapman pleaded guilty to murdering Lennon, saying that his guilty plea was the will of God. Under the terms of his guilty plea, he was sentenced to 20 years to life with eligibility for parole in the year 2000. Before his sentencing, he was given the opportunity to address the court, at which point he read a passage from the Catcher in the Rye book. As of September 2022, he has been denied parole 12 times, and remains locked up in an upstate New York prison. So what made Chapman want to shoot John Lennon? I mean, what motives could he possibly have? Well, Chapman was indeed a big fan of the Beatles, and he had no prior criminal convictions. He read the novel The Catcher in the Rye, and it had taken on great personal significance for him. One of the novel's main themes is Caulfield's rage against adult hypocrisy and phonies. Chapman claimed that he had been enraged by Lennon's infamous, much publicised remark in 1966 that the Beatles were more popular than Jesus. And by the lyrics of Lennon's songs God, in which Lennon states that he does not believe in the Beatles, God or Jesus. And the track Imagine, where Lennon states, imagine no possessions, yet had led a lavish lifestyle, making him a phony. On the 27th of October, 1980, Chapman purchased a five-shot .38 caliber charter arms revolver in Honolulu. He flew to New York on the 29th of October after contacting the Federal Aviation Administration to learn the best way to transport a revolver. Chapman learned that bullets can be damaged on the plane, so he arrived without ammunition. He left New York on the 12th or the 13th of November, then flew back on the 6th of December and checked into the Upper West Side YMCA for a night before moving to a Sheraton Hotel in Manhattan. He then left the Sheraton and made his way to the Dakota Apartments, where the rest is now history. And the